All right, everybody. Welcome to our book club. Today we have a very, very special guest with us. Uh, Jennifer Ryan, who is the author of the book that we just finished reading, is here with us today. Um, Jennifer is a mom with two girls who are growing way too fast. She loves taking them into the woods or into the mountains with their dog, Timmy, their bouncy golden retriever. Uh, Jennifer says that writing is her life and that sometimes people ask her how she can sit and write for so many hours. Uh, but the truth is that she just loves every moment. She feels as if there's something coming to life under her fingertips and that she's carefully creating a world and characters that act and feel emotions all by themselves. Um, this is her second time joining us at, her, at our book club. And this time it's for her brand new novel that we just finished reading, The Wedding Dress Sewing Circle. So welcome, welcome Jennifer. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. And thank you for that lovely introduction. That's wonderful. Thank you. It was lovely to be asked back. It's, um, it was lovely to meet everyone last time. And it's, it's really great to see you all again. So I do have a handful of questions for you if you're ready to get started. Absolutely, yeah. All right. So uh, my first question, I found that I was really impressed, especially as I was as I was reading more into the book and uh, Cressida. Is that how you pronounce her name? Cressida? That's right. Yeah. OK. Um, I found that I was really curious of how how did you learn about all of those intricacies of being a fashion designer and develop Cressida so well and all of the details about her work? Um, is that a natural passion of yours or did that take a lot of research to be able to develop her? Um, so it took a lot of research. Um, her character did and I spent some wonderful days. <laughs> I love research. I love research almost as much as writing as well. So, um, but uh, there was some wonderful um, uh, biographies about women from that era and also men from that era as well who were fashion designers and what kind of lives they had lived and how they came to be fashion designers and um, it, she was a, a kind of a, a melding together of a couple of you know real life um, couturiers and also fashion journalists. Um, I suppose what I was trying to really catch it was the woman of that time, there was a huge amount of women who were unable to get husbands after the, the, after the First World War. And that's really what I was trying to capture. This, these women, you know, there was this amazing sense of empowerment um, for women during that era, because, you know, if, if a woman, isn't going to go the traditional path of getting married and having children, what is she going to do? And it suddenly became suddenly much more acceptable for women to pick other vocations in life. And, um, and that's really what I wanted um, Cressida to kind of exemplify this, um, th this, um, ability, this sudden ability to suddenly go, right, no, I've got an alternative thing that I want to do over here. And she, she could do it because in that era, you know, there, there, was, there just weren't enough husbands to go around. So it was just much more acceptable. Um, and, but I mean, she would have had to have a lot of grit in order to get through that because even in that era, um, fashion design was still dominated by men. There were women involved in it, obviously, but um, uh, she she would have had to have um, really been um, really on top of her game, really, and very, very focused. And I really hope that came across in the book is that, you know, at the beginning of the book, she's, she's, she's a workaholic. She's a complete workaholic. She's absolutely everything is about her her business and about her designs and I think throughout the book she realizes that there's actually more to life than just being this very successful couturier 
Mm -hmm. I found that absolutely came through in the book and even through the middle and through the end she was still very much I have built up something for my life and kind of at no matter what I can't I can't give that up and even even at the end she still she still held on to that even though she realized some that there was more to life and she allowed herself to have more in life she still did not give up that that life that she had built for herself which I personally really um I really liked that aspect of Cressida for sure and the the drive and the grit and the determination and just the the bravery of her especially a high like a highborn to give up the title and that pampered life that was expected of her I found her to be a very very brave very determined inspiring woman for sure yeah so uh becoming a bohemian in Paris was definitely something that they did in those days. Um, uh, yeah, particularly the upper class, upper class women who didn't get married. They were, you know, they, they were quite flamboyant and they would go off, go off to France and become these bohemians. Um, and I really wanted that. That was the beginning of her story was, you know, she was like, I'm going off and, you know, becoming a bohemian with my friends and I'm going to and everything. And then it was out of that that she she um, she realized her freedom and the um, skills and talents that she had and and just progress those forever further um, to that design house. Yeah, I find that I I expected the I expected that Cressida would be the uh, the main character of the story, just the way like the back of the jacket was um, and everything. But to me, it I found I felt like this was really a story about Grace. I felt that Grace was actually um, the main character, and I'm curious if you feel like one of the three women was more of the main character, or if they were all the main character to you. Um, I, I think it's very much an interweaving of characters. That's what I really um, wanted. I, I think arguably Grace is the anchor, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, of the piece, uh, which is not really the same as the main character, but she, you know, she's the one that pulls everyone together right from the beginning. And yeah and she, she's the one who you know has this old relationship with Hugh that you know she's kind of tentatively you know wanting to resurrect yeah and um it, in a lot of ways that's you know it's um she is she she's the gel really in yeah. in the book yes yeah um which kind of ties into my next question about that style of writing um the way that you write your books with the chapters by uh, by character. Um, that's one of my favorite styles of, of books. And I know that you did that in your book, The Kitchen Front as well, which uh, I, I loved reading that one too. Um, is there a term for that type of writing? Uh, there isn't actually, no, but it's, um, you have a multiple narrative, I suppose, point of views, yeah. I find that that's, um, sorry, carry on. I, I, I find that that type of writing pulls me into the characters in a more in-depth way. So I always really enjoy when I see a book that's written in that style, not necessarily numbered chapters, but chapters by perspective of each character. I find, I find it just creates a more riveting story. So I love that. I love that that seems to be a theme in your writing. I really enjoy writing uh, these different characters. I think it really goes to show because you're telling a, a, a story as well about all of them together and, and how they're all working together at the same time. And so you, you, you've kind of got, so with this book, there's three main characters and then there's almost a fourth main character, which is them all working together in arguably the sewing circle and um uh, and that that almost forms a, a fourth character in itself if that makes sense 
Um, yeah. But I, I do, I really like working in this way because it's the different characters, are, you know, some of them are funny, you know, Violet was just so, you know, just so lighthearted. And I, I really enjoyed writing her, but it, it's so different from, you know, Cressida and then Grace is just always a little bit on the fence about everything, you know, <laughs> and, um, and Cressida, who's just so kind of determined and firm and yet kind of giving way all the time, sort of battling with herself. I think that um, uh, it, it, it's, it makes for a really nice writing uh, day because you just don't know what's going to happen next. You know, you kind of come back to the same character, but the thing is that the situation has shifted because of what happened to the last character, you know, in the last chapter. So you're there thinking, right, okay, what's this character going to do with the new situation as it is? Um, yeah, it, it's just more opportunity for more fun, I think. <laughs> Very, so what is your process for develop for developing these such in-depth characters? I, I have to say it is, um, sometimes I read books that just have the single narrative um, story with the one character. And I think, wow, that would be a lot easier. <laughs> um, because they don't need to fit in with each other and you just sit and you write this single narrative and every day it's the same character and you just carry on where you've left off. Um, with the kind of, you know, with this multiple narrative books, it is, it, it's so much more complicated. You really need to nail your characters down um, from the start and that never happens, you know. Um, it always needs a little bit of toying around, you know, who is this character? Let's try this character out and, um, and then swap her in for someone else if necessary. Uh, I think it's, um, I think uh, with the sewing circle wedding dress, it came together really quite quickly. Um, I think I, I had obviously the idea for Cressida um, was, was obviously, uh, I think I had her as a character right be before I even started writing anything. And, um, uh, and Grace as well, and I think Violet came a little bit later. Um, uh, and of course, all the members of the sewing circle, they all kind of developed over time, I think. You know, I think that um, Lottie went through a couple of different personalities before it became apparent that she was going to be Lottie, and that was that. <laughs> um, Yes, it is so. It, it is. It is. It, it's a lot of trial and error at the beginning, finding the right, the right, the right characters to really lead the story. Um, yeah, um, finding the right plots for them and everything is is actually the very easy part. It's quite quite easy to work out what what should happen to each one because once they've developed their own personalities and their own characters you you kind of can quickly see what you would what you think might happen to them or you know what you think they're going to do in different situations as you're developing them are you kind of writing their backstory that's not part of the story to develop them or do they kind of fall into place as you're actually writing the story itself? Or do you have to do some like some backlog writing to develop their backstory and develop their personality in something that's maybe not part of your book? Or are they developed as you write your book? That's a very good question because I was thinking about this recently. <laughs> what I always end up writing quite a lot of backstory for all of my different characters. And then I end up, um, it ends up being edited out of the book <laughs> and I think it's a lot of it is just my own process of getting to know that person and getting to know where they came from and what they've previously been through. Um, it's very difficult in a book. You don't want to 
it started a book with a lot of backstory, but at the same time, you know, everyone comes with a certain amount of um, backstory as well. So, but you don't want to bog down a book with too much information about, you know, if, if someone, if you're writing too much backstory, then that's, that's normally indicative of a problem with the character. Maybe you need to start their story a little bit earlier in their lives. <laughs> Okay. So that it's action rather than backstory, if you know what I mean. If someone someone's backstory was that they murdered someone, then you're probably better off showing the murder. <laughs> I see. Too much detail can almost influence the story too much in a way you don't want it to. I think so. I think so. But yes. I remember once reading that with every story you've got to know when to start it and when to finish it and the finishing is quite easy because obviously you finish it at the high point you know at the point where everything's resolved to a certain degree um but knowing where to start a story is is often a little bit more complicated than you know the, than you think yes yeah um were there other characters that were going to be in this story that ended up being edited out? Um, no, I don't think there were. No, there was always three characters. Okay. Um, this book really kind of came together quite quickly, actually, I'd say from the character's point of view and the, you know, um, uh, their, and, and, and the peripheral characters as well. Um, so, no, as I say, Lottie uh, was a bit different, I think, at the beginning, but she sort of, yeah, became the person that she is. Um, and Lottie's sister, Martha, who is one of my personal favourite characters, <laughs> she, um, she, she, uh, she, she was a much smaller character at the beginning, but because I really loved her, because she's so forthright for a 15 year old <laughs> she thinks she knows everything and bosses everyone around and um and she does know everything I mean that's the thing is that she's obviously a very bright girl who knows everything and I just I just thought yes there was something very endearing about her um yeah but but I, I think the way that they all all of the sewing circle all kind of um, they all accepted each other with, for their foibles. And um, I think that that was an important part of, of how they how they got along, yes. Yeah. So what sparked your interest in writing about the clothing rationing during World War II? It was um, when I was writing about the food rations. From the um, kitchen front. I, yeah, that's right, for the, the kitchen front, my last book. And I was, um, I did, a, I, obviously did a lot of um, research about that. And through the research, I ended up doing, uh, reading an awful lot about clothes ration as well. And, and for a while I thought, oh, should I add some of this into the kitchen front? And then I thought, no, I'd love to write a write book about, you know, the clothes ration. But actually it was when I was, um, when I was researching and I came across this story about a woman in, Cornwall, who um, shared her own wedding dress, she got married to a vicar. She was a young bride who just got married to a vicar in um, in this small parish in a um, in a village down in Cornwall, and she offered her wedding dress to anyone who got married in the village. And, and I thought, oh, isn't that lovely? <laughs> and that's how I started then from reading that, I then started looking into if anybody else was doing this. And of course they were, this was happening, I wouldn't say all over the country, but it was happening a lot, is that you hear these stories about these groups coming together or individuals um, sharing wedding dresses. and. That was really what sparked the idea for me. I just thought this is absolutely, I would really love to write a book about wedding dresses and 
how they share them because what a lovely the spirit of the war and everything it's yeah it 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 says an awful lot i felt about the time and how women helped each other through the difficulties and tries to try to raise spirits that was it i think i think in these small groups particularly in, in amongst women there really was a, a big effort that was put into keeping up spirits and um just you know helping helping each other out um and and i think that it, this is what i really try to bring out in all my books that the set in the second world war is this yeah this feeling of um empowerment as well that they get from each other absolutely um i will be honest i'm not very well read on topics of uh world war ii but it seems like the topic of you know everyday civilians navigating the challenges of trying to maintain everyday life during world world war ii um, is not a very common topic i've never actually seen a book or a movie that actually talks about this part of life the way that both of your books do um and i found it was such a fascinating uh way to to, to showcase that part of history um and it was also so refreshing especially to see like the women's perspective of of life kind of at home while the men were fighting um what what was your what was your research like to to retell that part of history from that perspective um well i think one of my best sources of um information is from the women themselves who were alive during that era and um there, there's a number of different sources one is from the women themselves um so i've i've i actually interviewed quite a few women who were alive during that time and um who were young women obviously they were young women during that time and it's just fascinating hearing their stories you know a lot of them remember the second world war as being a very um uplifting time they don't remember the tragedy so much as they remember this incredible empowerment and freedom that they felt uh, um, and all the parties and because dances and parties were all part of the um, trying to keep people's spirits up um, elements of the war. And there was an awful lot going on of free entertainment and people letting their hair down in more ways than one. And, um, and young women were really taking advantage of that. Um, and, um, uh, so, so it, I don't know, I think it's just very interesting and a lot of them really talked an awful lot about clothes and food. Everyone talked about food rationing, everyone did. Um, it was one of the first things people would talk about was food rationing and the crazy things they used to cook. Um, but quite a few people talked about the clothes rationing as well and how it was, you know, difficult to get the right, just when you needed to look good and you didn't have the right clothes. Um, and um, and the continual knitting, yeah, it was almost deemed unpatriotic. If you had idle hands, um, you would sort of get comments in trains and things if you weren't knitting. Um, so, uh, so there was that, actually talking to women, but also there's, um, there's diaries kept by women um and there's they there's something called the mass observation which is uh, a couple of sociologists at the beginning of the war decided to ask the country to keep diaries journals um of the war and send them into them and they would publish little parts of these in a kind of newsletter every couple of months and um and i think there's started off being about 500 people doing it and by the end of the war there was about 7,000 people um, most of them were women sending in journals um, and they're all preserved in a library in a university library in the UK so um, I was you know I can I was lucky enough to go in and um, 
and read a lot of those, but also a lot of those are actually in print, they're published as well. So, um, so I've got a, a pile of books of, you know, filled with either single journals or snippets of journals covering all these different subjects, um, including, um, uh, uh, including fashion and clothes rationing and everything which is fascinating. Um, so, so there's a lot of different ways. There's memoirs as well. I've got some great memoirs from the era. And um, uh, yes, and also textbooks as well, obviously, nonfiction books. Uh, some of them are excellent that have been written um, on, you know, all sorts of subjects from, you know, about the Second World War. Um, and there are some good ones about clothes and fashion as well, which is really, yeah, which were very, it's very useful. That's interesting that you mentioned that uh, the the women that you interviewed remembered like the freedoms that came and the and the you know the new ways of life that came about from the war and like the positivity from it. And I was pleasantly surprised as I read your book to see how much of that was coming through of how these women were able to break out of these social norms that they felt almost trapped in and that the war and the, you know, the circumstances, like we need to live for today because we don't know what is tomorrow. Like it, it, it gave them this incredible sense of freedom to live life in a way that made them happy, which I just, I really enjoyed reading that because, um, you know, even still today, there's a lot of people that still live their life feeling that they're trapped with their obligations or their jobs or even their relationships sometimes. Um, and I just found it so enjoyable to read your story of how these women were able to find their own freedoms and live life on their own terms. Um, it was one of my favorite aspects of the book and just to get that insight into what life was like for everyday civilians trying to navigate, trying to navigate life in this time. Um, my question is, how how common was it for these highborn women to start to break out of those traditional wars during during the war? Was was the war something that sparked that kind of freedom that Cressida and Violet found, or do you know were there younger generations before that starting to break those traditions of the well, high? As I said mobility? earlier, I think that Cressida was part of this new wave of women at the end of the First World War who found themselves single and that really for the first time ever that really um there, there was this big almost um uh public question what are these women going to do you know and um and they uh, as i say a lot of them you know just took on took on professions um it it wasn't it wouldn't have been acceptable to do an awful lot of different professions, but some of them were acceptable. Um, and having your own business, doing big charity works, um, dedicating your life to something. It, it was it it was considered this. You know, these women had to do something if they didn't have husbands. And and I think that that played a major role in realizing that women um you know were capable of doing other things if you know what I mean it just made it a bit more acceptable to break the mold you know um obviously it was still deemed better to you know get married and have children and everything but um but there were women around like Cressida who weren't doing that who weren't following that path um so, but I think the Second World War, the, the problem actually then was that, of course, there was almost a retaliation against that in that, um, particularly with the war, but you had an awful lot of parents who were forcing their daughters into marriage, any marriage, because they were scared that they'd end up on the shelf. Um, with the Second World War, a lot of parents were really worried that there was going to be the kind of carnage that happened in the First World War, where, I mean, there were two million British men were killed of a certain age. I mean, that's an entire generation just wiped out virtually. And, um, uh, yeah, and there was a fear that that would happen again, and they didn't want their daughters to be left on the shelf. So there was an awful lot of 
um, parents almost trying to, um, uh, you know, and, and this is what happened with Violet in, in the book is that her brother, after seeing what happened to Cressida, who was his aunt, who was his sister, um, he was determined that um, his daughter was not going to meet with the same fate, and he had absolutely brainwashed her into, this is the way you need to, you need to be, and this is, you need to attract the right man, and it's all about getting the right husband. And, and everything. And I think that, um, I think this was very common in those days, particularly after the First World War. I think a lot of the particularly upper classes were um, absolutely determined that their daughters marry well. <laughs> um, and yeah, but I, I like that Violet broke that mold. The, uh, and, uh, there was a lot of that happening in that time. Um, uh, yeah, there was an awful lot of that that kind of thing happening. Um, I read one that you know there was a uh, an upper class woman was writing that she um, she heard that her friend was going out with a commoner, and she said, "I don't know whether she knows where that's going, but you know she's." Um, uh, you know, in the war, can you ignore people from different backgrounds and you're working with them quite often and, um, and you develop, you know, friendships, etc., and romances and you can't really, there's, there's not really, um, uh, that suddenly there was like not the, um, the control that they used to be, particularly if they're, if, you know, with all the men off somewhere else, or their focus on something else as well. So anyway, this 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 uh, very upper class woman, her friend ended up getting married to this lower class man, and and then she said, and of course it didn't work out, but that was to be expected. <laughs> but um, but I think the fact that, that she actually married him, I think, is is quite incredible. The the British class system is, is, I don't know, it's an animal to itself, it's, yeah. Is it, <laughs> is it still, at, like, obviously with the royal family, it's still alive and well, but is there still, is there still, is it still active in British? Is there still those upper class, um, like, hierarchies in, in your, in the culture? Uh, there, there are, yes. It, yes, you wouldn't really speak about it, if you know what I mean. It's kind of a bit unspoken, but yes. And it's not to do with money. It's to do with kind of, I don't know, your family and how well-to-do you are. Um, yes, it's, it's, it's a complicated system. And that's why Kate Middleton, for instance, has never been accepted by the royal family because... She's she's a bit too middle class, um, uh, even though she's lovely, she's lovely woman. You know, um, yes, it's it's still alive and yeah, alive and kicking. Uh, <laughs> that's a, and that's a whole other topic that I'm sure we could talk for a whole other hour about that history, right? It is. I think that um, I think it creeps into my books quite a lot, actually, because it's something I, I think is, um, uh, it, it's, it's an extraordinary part of British culture. I don't think, it's certainly not around in America, thank goodness, because <laughs> you can live your life being, you know, completely absorbed with, you know, which class you're struggling to get into that you're in or that other people are in everything I, I think I think a lot of people are a little bit too obsessed with it <laughs> it sounds it sounds very stressful like Violet's Violet's character arcs to me was very stressful to read and once she got to that point where she married Landon and I remember being so relieved that she was going to move to Connecticut and not have to worry about all of that anymore. <laughs> I remember just for me personally thinking, oh, she doesn't have to worry about that stress of her last name and the manner. And she can just go 
live her life now. I remember that's kind of, I felt this relief for Violet when she made the choice to move to America, just that she could yes. get away yeah. from the pressure and the stress of her last name. Mm. Yes, and, and everything. Yes, yes, start afresh. Mm. I actually read that um, another book I would love to write is about the war brides, the women who um, got married to American soldiers and um, and moved over to North America um, at the um, at the end of the war. And um, I've read quite a few, quite a lot about them already in various things. But a lot of them, they were just desperate to get away from Britain. <laughs> oh, really? They really were. They were. I think that Britain was. It, it was in debt. There was rationing actually got worse after the end of the war. And there were, it, it was, it was, uh, uh, Britain was just in a bad state. And I think that, um, I, I think that they just wanted something, you know, after six years of war, they just wanted, uh, wanted an escape. They wanted something new and different. And America just, hadn't been touched by the war in, in quite the same way. Right. Um, and I, I think, yes, it was the freedom, once again, the freedom. Um, but it was very interesting because of course, sometimes all they'd seen from their husband was this beautiful man dressed in this gorgeous um, uh, uniform. And then, of course, if they, you know, they go back to his home in, you know, uh, somewhere in the country, in the American countryside where he's, you know, a, a farmer or something. <laughs> and suddenly they're, <laughs> they're living in this sort of, you know, house in the middle of nowhere with, um, yeah, surrounded by farmland and animals and all sorts of things. And suddenly realizing that their husband isn't this, you know, guy wearing a uniform anymore and life is very different. <laughs> yeah, that would have been a big adjustment for sure. Yeah, yeah. So many interesting stories. It's, um, yeah, it's great. Yeah, lots more, lots more content for you to pick up where you left off, right? Yes, yeah. Um, do you ever find... Um, that you could, you know, take your own character's advice on on living life to the fullest. Um, I kind of alluded to this, how, you know, even in everyday life, we get, we feel stuck in our obligations or our jobs or relationships uh, that don't make us happy. And like, as a writer, you have these, these wise characters in your books who give some great life advice. And, you know, have you ever taken your own character's advice or, or do your friends or, or people in your life ever take the advice of your characters or inspired by them in any way? Um, yes, I don't know. I, I do. <laughs> I do definitely. I, I definitely take heart from, you know, some of the, um, so, some of the advice, but I mean, obviously a lot of the advice comes it's channeled through me anyway if you see what I mean and um yeah I do remember doing some research about grief um for one of my books and um I remember finding it really useful um ever since then a lot of the things that I read and I, I ended up not writing as much as I'd researched about it um but it was it, it was just very um yes I, I kind of wanted to understand more about the grieving process and yeah and different ways that you could look at that and and I found that very useful I think and I found that very useful when I'm talking to people who are grieving yes um so yeah, sorry, that's putting a downer on the evening, on, on, on the event a bit, yeah. But um, yes, I, I think I think some of the bigger, bigger ideas about um uh yes, trying to free yourself from the constraints that you're in 
I honestly, I mean, it's different. Sometimes it's just hard work to see the wood for the trees, you know, when you're in your own life um, to understand that. And, and, and I think in the nature of, for instance, you know, Cressida can see what's happening to her friends in the same way that her friends are looking at her and they can see the problem that what's constraining her as well. Um, and I think that's where you really need friends, really, is to kind of, you know, in, in a way to help you understand some of the situations that you're in, how you could look at things in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I, I would imagine that being a writer and having personally developed all of these different people with all of these different perspectives, it's almost, I mean, is it almost like you have this internal group of friends who are kind of in there to channel your inner Cressida and channel your inner Violet of what would they say? I actually, you're right. That is so, that's so funny that you say that because I always said that everyone needs an Audrey in their lives, yeah? From yes. The kitchen front. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And because even though she's not always right and she'd be the first person to say, I'm not always right, you know, but I think it's that heart that's in her, that real, and that there's that solid kind of morality, you know, that, you know, there's that moment in, sorry, I'm going back to the kitchen front here again. Um, there's that moment in the kitchen front where Zelda is supposed to be staying at her house, but she has decided there is no way she's, she's she can't cope as it is, let alone take in another person living in her house. And it's when Zelda, when it when she realizes that Zelda is pregnant, that she suddenly, and Zelda meanwhile, is trying to cover up the fact that she's pregnant. But as soon as she realizes that Zelda's pregnant, she's like, okay, you you have to stay here now, yep. you know, because yeah, huge because you have moment. to. I can't turn you away because you're pregnant. There's no way I can do that. And, you know, I, I think that that is a, that is, it's a moment in the book that we really see Audrey and I think she really sees herself and she hates herself for doing it. But she kind of, she, she, recognizes that she that's who she is and um and she is that person and I, I love that that moral compass that she has that she always comes back to um and I, I think we all have that moral compass in ourselves um and if we don't we can ask Audrey <laughs> and see what she would do under the circumstances um but yes yeah you're right you're right they're they're like old friends yeah I uh I, I think I might know the answer to this question you might have just answered it but um I personally found that I really really related to Cressida and I saw a lot of myself in her um and I'm curious is there a character that you most relate to possibly possibly a character from the kitchen front not the wedding dress sewing circle, but is there is there a character that you've developed that you see yourself the most in? Um, no, not really. <laughs> I thought you <laughs> might have answered Audrey. Audrey, but I don't. I don't think that I am. I, I don't think that I would be totally like Audrey. Um, but um, I don't know. I, I think all of them have a bit of me in in them if you know what I mean, I can definitely imagine myself being that person because I, I suppose it's that kind of empathy that you that you can kind of put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Um, yes, so, um, but you know, there's, I don't know, I really felt for Grace as well. She was, she, sometimes I felt like shaking her but you know on the whole yes. I, I also I found myself feeling that as I was reading sometimes <laughs> <laughs> um and Violet was just so was just so funny and I don't know I I loved I, I loved I yes I, I loved the way that she really transitioned from being this 
really quite annoying spoiled brat into being someone who was just so full of life and um yeah and and helpful and yeah I, I think that they all learned something from each other mm-hmm. um and I think that in a way you know that that was kind of the goal um but obviously it it it, it wasn't a um process or anything but I, I suppose you know by bringing them all together in the kitchen for in, in the sorry in the sewing circle that meant that they would all kind of rub off on each other and kind of try and try to understand each, themselves through each other mm-hmm. um and Mrs. Bisgood obviously <laughs> I have to say that Violet's character arc was definitely my favorite. I don't know if I have a favorite character per se, but Violet's um, storyline and where she ended up was definitely my favorite of the characters for sure. Yes. Um, I'm curious about some more like um, questions about life as an author now. Um, What's the most challenging part of being a published author? Um, The work (laughs) (laughs) the work it's so it's just um I don't know my husband says that I'm a workaholic um I just get sort of very attached into a story and it is very difficult to put it down because my desk is you know um at, at home it you know if, if there isn't any particular reason for me to be dragged away from it, then I can spend an awful lot of hours there. Um, and I love writing, so that's the other thing. But I I, I don't know. I, I think it's very easy to get quite burnt out because, you, you know, you do kind of... And, and then in the middle of the night, you can have a brilliant idea. And before you know it, you're back at it again. You know, it's... um. It, it's it's different it, it's oh it, yes it's a difficult thing to keep going um I don't know I think I need more of a kind of nine to five routine <laughs> in the future I think I need to try and balance balance it out a bit a bit, a bit better and stop, stop working so so much yes yeah um, so I'd say that's quite hard. Um, uh, I love the research. I, I really enjoy it. It's, it's a, it's an amazing. Um, yeah, sometimes I have moments like this where I stand back and go, "Oh my goodness, I can't believe I have published like um, four books." But it's, you know, I, it was always a dream of mine to have a book published. I used to be a book editor and. Um, I think, you know, right from the beginning, I thought that it might it, it would be really fun to write my own book and have it published. And I don't know, it, it feels like a dream come true that that's actually happened. And um, and writing about women in the Second World War is just fascinating. It's um, so I'm, you know, I'm working on, you know, women's empowerment from the Second World War and the historical you know um context as well so it's it's just amazing yeah i'm very uh grateful to have been introduced to your work because um i've never i've never read anything quite like it and i i find it to be very eye opening to see uh to be able to read about what women went through um sometimes we i'm a millennial sometimes you know we think that things are pretty tough and then you get to read this and think wow i have never experienced hardship before and i'm really grateful to have um found your work and i really love reading it and i hope that you will have another book out for us to enjoy again in the future um thank you (laughs) i have another question more about um when you have a when you have a new book that you want to write I'm curious the 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 timeline. Are you the one that reaches out to your publisher saying, you know, this is a proposal for a new book, or does your publisher reach out to you and say it's time for a new book? So what's been happening is that I finish one book 
and then I already have some ideas because ideas just happen. <laughs> um, and I jot them down and um, when they happen. And so once I finished a book, I'll email normally my agent first actually with some ideas and I'll put them by her. And then she has a think about it and then she'll get back to me with some either some comments or, oh, I like that one and, you know, whatever. And then maybe we talk about it a bit with my editor at that point. Um, and it kind of goes on from there, really. Mm -hmm. it, like it doesn't really follow a very standard course. Um, yeah. So that's that's how things have been going. Yes. My, um, my publisher, my editor, um, seems to be very keen to keep me on. <laughs> so that's really, that's really good. That's great. Um, so, so I'm very lucky in that, that respect. Yeah. Yeah. I know that as a, as now a reader of your work, I'm very, um, eager for your publisher to keep you on board as well. Um, oh, thank you. Since you started as an editor, did that influence the way that you then, um, became a writer and you know having that having that background information on how editing process works do you think that made it made a difference in the way that you became a writer and the way that you write your work yes yes very much so yes even now I'm much more of an editor than a writer so I write my first draft and then I mess about with it and I edit it and I rewrite large chunks of it and change the order of things and all sorts I'm very much an editor I um the first draft is very much a very first draft <laughs> yes um a lot of writers have problems in editing um but that is that's that's never been a problem for me <laughs> So I, I think it's quite, it's very useful. It's very useful. So yeah, that seems like that. it would be, it would be like an added skill that you have on top of this to make, maybe make writing easier or make it more, make it more tangible, make it flow more easily because you have that background experience maybe. Yeah, well, I, I used to be a nonfiction editor and nonfiction editors end up doing a lot of writing because, or rewriting because, you get books for particularly when you're a, a jobber, if you know what I mean, when you're like one of the assistant editors, you know, coming through the lines. You get like medical books written by doctors and they haven't got a clue how to write. Right. So you've got all this jumbled information and you basically have to write it, rewrite the entire book, basically. Um, some of the books that I had when I was an editor, and they were just a list of things that would be in the book if the person writing it could be bothered to write <laughs> or well had the time and so right. you would literally just end up writing the book using the information that was given and um and doing your own research obviously to kind of fill in the gaps um so yeah there was always a, a large amount of writing that was involved in it and and I think that really taught me how to sit sit for hours on end writing I think um I think a lot of writers a lot of authors um struggle with that whole you sit down and you write a lot long long amounts of time and I have I once again I've never had that problem because I used to get paid to do it <laughs> right. so yeah so I'm quite used to that so yes I, I think it I think it really helped in a lot of different ways yeah so what is your favorite part of being a published author? Um, I don't really know. I, I, um, I really love doing um, book clubs like this one. It's, um, it's lovely to meet readers and, you know, um, see how much the books are being enjoyed and appreciated. That's really, um, that's really lovely. Um, uh, I don't know. I love it when I finished a book um, or nearly finished a book. Um, there's almost like a, a a middle section about two about two thirds through 
where I'm editing it and you're just having these really good ideas about how you could actually improve the story and that is just a wonderful moment in um in the whole writing process where you're just standing back and looking at it and thinking how can I make this better how can I really make this work better how can I really show this um some of the some of the things that I'm trying to show that the historical points particularly and and sometimes it's the emotions involved in the book and I you know it's um sometimes it's just to do with timing sometimes it's to do with the personalities and everything and but I don't know there's this wonderful moment in a book where at, at one point in the timeline of creating it that you yes that you it's not quite finished but you can really put this amazing moments into it and you can change things around to really create um yeah much more of a, a, a better meaning sense of meaning to it yeah that's that's a great that's a great feeling too that sounds like a that sounds like a great moment to get to experience for sure um i have a, one more question for you the I really, really, really love this book. Honestly, more than I more than I thought I would. It's uh, it's a genre I don't normally pick up for myself, um, but I really, really loved it. And um, as I was reading it, I I was just thinking like this would make an incredible film. It's you know it has all of these elements. It has these amazing love stories. It has fantastic character arcs. It has really intense moments of when reality hits in. Um, and I just couldn't help thinking that like this would make one one phenomenal film. Um, so to put you on the spot a little bit, who who do you think would be would be a good cast for your three for your three women if this were to be turned into a film? Um, gosh, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. Um, so I have to confess that I'm not very good at actresses' names. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, Cressida, um, I, I don't know, I'm not really too sure. What about the woman, oh, I think her name is something Coleman and she plays, she's an English actress and she plays the queen in the crown um i've got a comment here knows. olivia coleman that's right yes maybe she would be good she, I, I think she's just a very good actress and i think she could put her mind to it mm -hmm. um either her or helena bonham carter maybe oh yeah. um would be good as uh, you know just someone who's just a little bit eccentric and he can yeah um violet oh um lily james probably is it lily james you can so. um uh yes i think i've seen her doing some kind of historical stuff too and i think she'd Yes, I think she'd be, uh, yeah, she'd be good. I think she can do that ditziness of her at the beginning. And yeah, and then the, yeah. Um, and Grace, I don't know about Grace. Oh, dear Grace. Who do you think? I don't know. I, I put a lot of thought into it when I thought of this question. I went, I, I don't know. Grace, <laughs> I don't know. Grace is so somewhat. Grace is so elegant, and I don't know if anybody wants to pop in the chat who they think would make a good Grace. I don't know if anybody has any ideas, but uh, I wasn't, and I wasn't sure. I thought, I wonder, I wonder if Jennifer's had ever has ever thought of this, and this might be a tough question. So I appreciate you playing it out with me. <laughs> I'll have a think about it though. It's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
Anne Hathaway for Grace, someone said that could be good. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. I can see that because she's got that elegance. And, Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much for spending some more time with us today. Um, we always love having you and we always love reading your books. So we hope that you'll have a have another one out in the future for us to for us to read. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so it's been so wonderful to see you all again. And um, thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. And uh, all the best to you. And I hope that we'll see you in the future again, Jennifer. Well, thank you. Bye, Ben. <laughs> All righty, and thank you everybody for coming. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to stop this recording. Let's start with that. And then I'm going to, I'm going to upload it.